Well, thank you, Ray, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time out to uh, come and hear our Bible address this evening. I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ will return to this earth to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. This is a photo of a painting on our wall at home, an artist's impression of the temple that will be built at Jerusalem with a family going up to worship God. And you can see similar depictions on the walls in this room. Some of us have similar in our own homes. Many of us have Bible covers with a favourite kingdom verse or kingdom image on them. You might be familiar with the Lord's Prayer when the disciples asked their Lord, teach us how to pray. He said, after this manner pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is our expectation and our prayer. It is our hope that the Lord Jesus Christ will return soon to establish the kingdom of God on this earth. And the Bible shows some of the changes that will occur with the return of Jesus Christ to the earth and the establishment of the kingdom of God. Under the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be a worldwide kingdom. The rule of Jesus Christ will spread across the entire world, bringing with it consistent government. Jerusalem will become the capital of the world and live up to its name, which means a city of peace. It will be a time of peace and not war. There's a quote there from Isaiah 2, and most of you will be familiar that it's also etched on the... Uh, come on. Not playing, not playing cricket, is it? All right. <clears throat> that quote is etched on the uh, the walls of First Avenue steps, close to the United Nations headquarters in New York. And the sculpture on the right was actually gifted to the United Nations by the USSR in 1959. And the action symbolises man's desire to put an end to war and transform tools of destruction into tools of benefit for mankind. It will be a time of peace and not war. But that desire of man will not happen until the Lord's Jesus Christ's return and his establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. The Lord Jesus Christ will ensure that the less fortunate are released from the burdens of their lives. There'll be an abundance of food there will be safety for all. We will be safe in our homes. Diseases will be controlled and people will live longer. And finally, I'm not sure where that is, but finally, at the end of the thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will destroy death on the earth. And Revelation chapter 21, verse 4 tells us that at that time, God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, and neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. So there are many reasons for us to look forward to a better day. And the Bible is very clear that the return of Jesus Christ is going to make, mark a great change in the world. A change in which the social problems will be solved and when it shall be a real pleasure to live. And if you want a little summary of those, on your way out, we have some little cards where all those points are articulated. That is our expectation and our hope. And in today's society of which it has been said, the only thing we can be certain of is uncertainty. The hope the Holy Bible contains is ours and it can be yours also. And the point that we want to make tonight, this hope necessitates the return of the Lord Jesus Christ 
And on this, the Bible is very clear. Jesus Christ will return to this earth to establish the kingdom of God on this earth. You know, before Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave his apostles the great commission to go and preach the gospel to the whole creation. We see this if you turn over to Mark chapter 16. In Mark chapter 16, he gives them this commission in verse 15. He says unto them, unto his disciples, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. And then, having given them this great commission, we see two things happen at the end of Mark chapter 16. In verses 19 to 20. The Lord Jesus was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And the apostles and followers of Jesus Christ went out and preached everywhere the gospel. The word gospel means good news or glad tidings. They went everywhere and taught the message from God which has the power to save. With the Lord, in verse 20, working with them and confirming the message through the accompanying signs. And that takes us now very neatly to our reading from Acts chapter 1. So, Ray, if you could come forward and read that for us. So, Acts chapter 1 and verses 6 to 12. Thank you. So, reading Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the, of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. Thanks, Ray. So we've just had read for us the narrative of the apostles coming together and witnessing Jesus' ascension into heaven. And as the disciples were looking on, the Lord Jesus was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And we're told two men stood by them in white robes, no doubt two angels or messengers of God, who said in verse 11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? You can picture them, their surprise and awe and, 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 and wonder as with eyes like saucers, mouths wide open, they were looking up. This same Jesus, said these two men, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Just before, in verse 6, they had been in conversation with the Lord Jesus and asked him, Lord, is this the time when you were restoring the kingdom to Israel? You see, they expected Jesus to restore the kingdom to Israel. The Lord Jesus says, look, it's not for you to know the times that God has fixed by his own authority. In other words, yes, I will restore the kingdom to Israel, 
but not now. Instead, he reminds them in verse 8 of the great commission which he had already given them earlier. Remember, we read in Mark chapter 16, to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And he tells them that they would receive the Holy Spirit, God's separate power, to help them in the work. And then he was taken up. You might like to jot down Luke 24, verse 51, which tells us he was carried by the angels to his father. And as the disciples stood there, spellbound, gazing up into heaven, trying to fathom out what they had seen, the message came from the two angels. Why are you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which you have seen going into heaven will return. He will come back in the same way as you have seen him go into heaven. As far as the Bible, the Holy Bible goes, the greatest prophecy of the Bible is about Jesus Christ. There are, in fact, over 300 prophecies about Jesus' birth and ministry which are fulfilled, spoken of in the Old Testament and fulfilled in his life. And there are at least 500 prophecies concerning Jesus' return within the pages of the Bible. So in the remainder of this talk, as our title suggests, I want to talk about these. But don't worry, we're not going to go through all 500. I'll just pick a few and talk about those and hopefully you'll begin to see that the great message of the hope in the Bible is that Jesus Christ is going to return. Okay, well, let's just lay some groundwork for why I have selected these few prophecies. Bible means the book. Holy means set apart. So the Bible is the book that has been set apart for man to become wise in God's ways. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and 2 Timothy chapter 3, it tells us that God is the author. He moved men to write by his spirit power the words that we read from the Holy Bible. It consists of one volume. It's made up of 66 books divided into the Old and to the New Testament. And through it, there are various writers from all walks of life. In fact, it was written by about 40 men who lived during a 1,500-year period. Um, Pick that there. Beginning with Moses. The Old Testament was begun by Moses in about the 15th century BC and was finished by Malachi about 430 BC. And the New Testament was written during the lifetime of the apostles after Jesus Christ was lifted up into heaven. And it finishes with the apostle John as an old man writing the book of Revelation about AD 96. So, over about a 1500 period, 1500 year period. It consists of one volume, as we said, made up of 66 books. And those writers that, we, we, uh, that recorded those come from all sorts of walks of life. There were kings, such as David and Solomon. There were prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah. There were priests, such as Samuel. There were statesmen, such as Daniel and Moses. There were shepherds, such as David and Moses. Physicians, such as Luke. Tax gatherers. Fishermen, such as Peter and John. So people, those writers, were from all sorts of walks of life. It was written from different places and countries. From Arabia, by Moses. From Babylon, by Ezekiel and Daniel. From Palestine, which is the name that conquering Rome gave to the ancient land of Israel uh, in an attempt to obliterate and delegitimize the Jewish presence. We had Matthew and Mark. Paul wrote from Asia and Italy. John from Patmos. So all sorts of different places and countries. It was written in two different languages. The Old Testament of 39 books is written mainly in Hebrew and also Aramaic in about 250 verses out of 23,000. 
that Aramaic is used in the book of Daniel, Ezra, and a few other places. And the New Testament of 27 books is written mainly in Greek. It has a cast of 2,930 characters set in 1,551 places. And yet, despite all of that, the Bible does not contradict itself. It still has one consistent message and evidences an incredible harmony of thought and not least of all, is infused with prophecies concerning the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I already said, the greatest prophecy of the Bible is about Jesus Christ and there are at least 500 prophecies concerning Jesus' return. Well, we start our brief journey considering a few of these in the beginning. At Genesis 3, around the year 4000 BC, Abraham and Eve had just transgressed the law of God not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was in the midst of the garden that they had been placed in. We know Eve was deceived by the serpent and she broke the law of God and ate of that fruit. She then enticed Adam to do the same thing. They had been explicitly told by God not to eat it. He said that in the day you eat of it, you shall be subject to death. But they did eat of it. And as a result of their transgression, they felt ashamed and they tried to hide themselves from God. The cause of their evil conscience was, in fact, sin. Sin took away the answer of a good conscience towards God and it converted it into an evil conscience and they felt ashamed and harassed by doubts and fears. It follows that if sin can be removed, then the conscience can be corrected towards God. And God made a very clear promise in words addressed to the serpent after the transgression. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the sentence contained the elements of judgment and punishment, and yet it also contained the first rays of hope. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. There was the promise of a seed that would overcome sin and redeem man from the predicament into which he had gotten himself. And that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, which much later in history, he crushed the head of the serpent. He destroyed the power of sin by his death and resurrection. And that bruise, the blow, that the serpent gave on his heel was temporary and healed, for he triumphed and he was resurrected from the dead on the first day. Okay, fast track 2,000 years to Genesis chapter 12 to 22. The promises that were given to Abraham. They were given around 2000 BC. And the eighth and the final promise was one that was given unconditionally after Abraham showed great obedience and faith in God. And God confirmed the promise with an oath in Genesis chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 22 and verses 16 to 18 we read, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withhold thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and, they, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed, and Paul in Galatians 3 verse 16 says, this seed is singular and names him as Christ. He saith, where in Galatians 3 it says, he saith not unto seeds of, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ, so God goes on to say in his promise to Abraham, and in thy seed that is in Christ shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. And on that point, it's also worth noting the very first words of the New Testament, which record the life of Jesus, and they make exactly that connection in the words of Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, 
who was the son of David, who was the son of Abraham. And Abraham was to be blessed personally. His seed, both natural and spiritual, would be too great to count, as we see there in the beginning of those verses. But he's also told, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And there is a link back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. He was told his seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, would conquer sin and death, and then the kingdoms of this world. In thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, and the whole earth would be blessed and at peace when his seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, reigns. Okay, fast track another thousand years to 2 Samuel and chapter 7. And here God makes a promise to King David. It's given around 1000 BC when David was king of Israel. What's the connection with David, you might ask? Well, again, remember those very first words of the New Testament in Matthew chapter 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And we read in 2 Samuel chapter 7, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the son of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. That promise couldn't have been talking about David's son Solomon, who was the next king of Israel, who reigned over Israel after David died. Because God said to David, your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. So that promise wasn't fulfilled in Solomon. Come over to Acts chapter 2 because here the Apostle Peter makes exactly that point. In Acts chapter 2 and verses 39 to 30. This is written around AD 34. And the Apostle Peter standing up makes an appeal. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. Okay, there's our point. David died, he's buried, his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, this is 2 Samuel 7. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in the grave, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promises of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens. But he says himself, and he's citing the writing of David himself from Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. OK, turn over a few pages. First of Corinthians chapter 15. Here, the Apostle Paul is writing to those at Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and you will see the theme coming through, starting from verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, 
Okay, there was the transgression that took place back there in Genesis chapter 2 and th- well, chapter 3. For since by man came death, by man also, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, came the resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ to the first fruits, after those who are Christ at his coming, and then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, that is God, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Okay, let's keep those words in mind. Maybe they need a little bit more explanation. There's a couple little phrases that we will come back to just shortly. What I want to do now is to move back to the year 650 BC. At that time, there was a man called Daniel. Daniel. He was a Jewish man. He was a prince who had been taken into captivity in Babylon. And at the time, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream. It's likely that he had the same dream over multiple nights. The dream terrified him. And he wanted to know what it meant. Well, by and by, Daniel told him the dream of a great image made of different materials and then gave him the interpretation. So there's Daniel 2 on our timeline. Well, the dream was told. And Daniel was able to describe to Nebuchadnezzar that what he had seen was an image that was made up of different materials, a head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron and feet of part iron and part clay. We come to Daniel chapter 2, we read of that, that description. In Daniel chapter 2 and verses 34 to 35. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that there was no uh, no trace of them found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And then Daniel gave the interpretation. See, Nebuchadnezzar was quite smart. He wasn't going to accept an interpretation of his dream until you were able to actually tell him what he dreamt. Well, God had revealed to Daniel what that dream was and he'd also revealed to Daniel the interpretation. And the interpretation was given Nebuchadnezzar's dream was a blueprint to successive kingdoms. Have a look at the end of Daniel 2 in verse 38. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, Thou art this head of gold. In verse 39, After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom, and so on. So he prophesies the fall of the Babylonian Empire and the rise and the and fall of the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Roman Empire, and divided European powers. And that's what we see today, a divided Europe. An amazing prophecy with great detail, written well before the events happened, that accurately predicted the overcoming of the kingdoms and empires that rules around, or that ruled around the area of Jerusalem. But you will remember The last part of the dream was of a stone that was cut out without hands and that struck the image on its feet, crushed the image into powder, and then that stone grew 
and grew until it filled the whole earth. And the interpretation of that is given in Daniel 2, verses 44 to 45. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever, inasmuch as he saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. Well, that's exactly what we read back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. That's recorded in the book that is on your lap. That's the inspiration and the proof of God, the author of the Bible, having the power over the kingdoms of men. That's the evidence we have got that is the reason we have got to believe that the stone will come. Just like after Babylon, the Medes and Persians came. Just after, like after the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks came. And just like after the Greeks, the Romans came. And just like after the Romans, Europe was divided up. Just like after that, the stone will come. And we have great reason to believe it. And there's another point to consider. When that stone power hits the image, it will grow and grow and fill the whole earth. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 28 says at the end there, When all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things unto him, that God may be all in all. That is not ladies and gentlemen, a new prophecy. Habakkuk, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wrote that in 490 BC. David in 1000 BC in Psalm 72, and blessed be his glorious name forever and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And God in 1500 BC But as truly as I live, he said, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Numbers 14 was written around that time when the children of Israel had just refused to go into the land which God had promised them. And God passed upon them the judgment that all those over the age of 20 would perish in the wilderness. But Numbers 14 and verse 21 never doubt God's purpose. God knew that with those remaining, he would continue to work his purpose and at the end of days, his purpose would be fulfilled. The earth would be filled with his glory. And the third point that we see from 1 Corinthians 15, we see is in verse 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And the Apostle Paul, writing in AD 56, tells us in Romans 6, verse 23, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the promise we read earlier from Genesis 3, verse 15. The promise that was recorded by Moses in 1500 BC as he wrote about the creation which occurred around 4000 BC. Okay, remember back to our reading again from Acts chapter 1. Perhaps just turn back to it. Just before Jesus' ascension into heaven, in verse 6, the disciples had been in conversation with the Lord Jesus and they asked him a question. They asked, Lord, is this the time when you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? The kingdom to Israel. There's no doubt the disciples of Jesus were Jewish-centric and focused. 
They believed that the kingdom of God was going to be set up in Israel. But it wasn't actually too much of a misdirection because as far as prophecy goes, in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28, Jesus had said to them when Peter had asked what is going to happen to them forsaking all and following Jesus, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. They expected Jesus to restore the kingdom. And the Lord Jesus said, Look, it's not for you to know the times that God has fixed by his own authority. In other words, as we've already said, yes, but not now. Why couldn't he restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, at the time that Jesus was alive, only two of the tribes of Israel were represented in the land, Judah and Benjamin. The other ten tribes had been taken into captivity by the Assyrians in 722 BC. And that event marked the end of the northern kingdom of Israel. The northern kingdom of Israel consisted of ten tribes. And that event is often referred to as the Assyrian captivity or exile. But the disciples had been told that they would sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So they had missed a little point, hadn't they? Because at that time, when Jesus spoke to them, there were only two tribes in Israel. Well, Ezekiel has something for us to consider about this. Come back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel is an Old Testament prophet. When I say come back to Ezekiel, come back to chapter 37. He's writing sometime between 593 and 560 BC. And <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 37 and verses 15 to 25 is also known as the vision of the valley of dry bones. What is this vision about? Well, this vision is in the middle of a number of prophecies which are called the restoration of Israel. Israel was in the middle of captivity. Ezekiel was living in Babylon in that captivity and he was looking forward and receiving visions from God about the restoration of his people. But there was much more to the visions that he was being given than just the restoring out of Babylon back to the land of Israel. Because the vision he was getting was involving the 12 tribes of Israel. It was only the two tribes that were in captivity, Judah and Benjamin. But he was receiving visions of the restoration of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so in Ezekiel chapter 37, we get this vision of a valley of dry bones. You see in verse 1, Ezekiel is set down in the middle of a valley of dry bones. He's asked the question of verse 3, can this valley of dry bones ever live? And Ezekiel answers, O Lord God, thou knowest. In verse 4, again, God says to Ezekiel, prophesy about these bones. Say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of God. And thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. It's actually a picture of a resurrection. It's a picture of dry bones being brought back to life. Who are these bones? Well, verse 11, Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off. Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then ye shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. So this is a prophecy of the return of the Jewish nation to the land. In AD 70, the Romans came and they destroyed Jerusalem and they scattered the people. It was a direct punishment by God for putting to death their Messiah, for putting to death 
Jesus Christ. And for a period of 1,878 years, there was no homeland for the nation of Israel. This was, of course, changed after the Zionist movement began in 1897. And the UN Council in 1948 passed a resolution that, would be, that, that they would be given the land of Palestine, the land of Israel, and that they would be known as the people of Israel. That is a fulfilment of Ezekiel 37. Bro bones brought back together and placed in the very land of Israel as God had assured would happen. Okay, well that gives us great confidence to believe the words of this prophet. And so we come across to verse 15. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take one stick and write upon it for Judah. And for the children of Israel, his companions, then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. So the prophet has two sticks. One's got Judah written on it, and the other has Ephraim for all the house of Israel. And he's told by God to put those two sticks together. Why? Well, in verse 19, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the land of, hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more. So even although the ten tribes of Israel are scattered, the very fact that God has brought back to the land the nation of Israel is a foretaste of the proof of the fact that not only had the two tribes returned to the land, but the other ten tribes will return and be joined to them also. And there is going to be one king ruling over them. The king is the king of Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28. The Lord Jesus Christ. So the disciples, when they asked Jesus in Acts chapter 1 verse 6, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of, to Israel? And they were actually in harmony with the prophecies of the Old Testament. Having said that, they had a very Jewish-centric impression of what was going to happen because the next thing that Jesus said is that before that happens, you need to go out and preach the gospel in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to all the world. So it's not just a kingdom that focuses on the nation of Israel, but it was going to be a worldwide kingdom and all the people of the world are going to be able to know about it and to be a part of it. Zechariah was also an Old Testament prophet. He wrote sometime between 520 and 490 BC. I want you to come across to Zechariah and chapter 14. And I'm sure as we read these verses, you will not fail to see an echo. Verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations to a battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle, and in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. Wow. That's an echo of Acts chapter 1. If there's ever one, let me remind you again, Acts 1 verse 12, we're told that the apostles returned unto the city of Jerusalem from the Mount 
called Olivet. So the Mount of Olives was the very same place they witnessed Jesus' ascension into heaven. The very same place where they heard the words of the two men in white apparel who said, Ye men of Galilee, which, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which was just taken from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And so in verse 4 of Zechariah 14, And in that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, Uzziah king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. And it shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The light will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. And in that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea. And in both summer and winter it shall occur. So there's <clears throat> a sweeping uh, prophecy there of, well, we'll say Armageddon, and then <clears throat> the, the results of a great earthquake and the topography of the land and, and, and how Israel are going to be dwelling in that land. But here's the important thing. The Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. All the land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate and the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. The people shall dwell in it and no longer shall there be utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. So there's no doubt that the Lord Jesus Christ will return to this earth to establish the kingdom of God on this earth. The day of the Lord is coming when his feet will stand again on the Mount of Olives. And the Bible is infused with such prophecies. But so what? <laughs> An academic exercise, I guess, you might say, to trace all of those. Well, yes, it is, unless they have some meaning for us. Come across to Acts chapter 3. We've already looked at the words of Peter in Acts chapter 2. And here in Acts chapter 3, he is speaking again in another appeal to the Jewish people and to us as well. In Acts chapter 3 and taking up his words from verse 18. For those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he is thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, and he cites Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verses 15 to 19, a passage that was written around 1500 BC, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him ye shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets, from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. And we've just seen a, a little small taste of some of that. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Here another echo. Peter is citing Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18. 
which we read from earlier. The promises made to Abraham. The seed, singular, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed, singular again, the Lord Jesus Christ, in thy seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The gospel message was given to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. It was taken to the uttermost parts of the world. Salvation is for Jew and it's also for Gentile. It's for all those who will hear the words of the prophet like Moses. God's servant, the Lord Jesus Christ, raised up from their midst to turn away the iniquities of us all. And our hope and prayer is that, as us, you will also choose to embrace the great hope of the Bible. Writing in AD 96, the Apostle John recorded these words. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That is the great hope of the Bible. There are over 500 prophecies that foretell this event. And may it be that you choose with us to be a part of that day. So I'll leave it to Ray to close off. Uh, up there on the screen is our subject for next week. Um, Armageddon, a battle prophesied in the Bible, which uh, maybe our speaker on that occasion will go into a little bit more of what I was reading from Zechariah chapter 14. Thanks.